Okay, we come to the main event of the evening. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you in a second, uh, Quentin McGrath. And by the way, if, you, uh, <clears throat> if you're like me and you're British, we know how to pronounce McGrath, not McGrath. Um, we have some very famous cricket people called McGrath, so we know how to pronounce that. Uh, Quentin himself is actually from South Africa, uh, another great cricketing nation that we just beat. Sorry about that. Um, so, so Quentin actually spent 24 years at Deloitte. Uh, he was actually their uh, first CIO for South Africa. Uh, and uh, then since then relocated to the US and was part of the global CIO leadership team for, uh, for Deloitte as well. And he's since retired and has actually just done his doctorate and just got it, right? I mean, it was like, literally last week. So huge congratulations on that. And I love the terminology. He defended his dissertation on AI ethics and enterprise risk management. Uh, and that was at the University of South Florida's Moomer College of uh, Business. Quentin is also an uh, advisory board member for an early stage VC organization. He's also a board member of SIM Tampa Bay chapter. So he's a good friend of SIM. And he started up the SIM Nationals Rethink Everything Interest Group. Uh, and we're actually going to talk about interest groups next month. So uh, do, do look out for that. And he's focusing on the impact of convergence uh, today's, or the convergence of today's mega trends and rapidly evolving technologies on the CIOs and their organizations. So please give a very warm sim welcome to our good friend, Quentin McGrath. Got a mic, a mic up, thank you. That'd be great, thank you very much. And, and wonderful to be here this evening. It's just, it's awesome to get back in person, isn't it? <laughs> and get back together and, uh, and have some wonderful food and this wonderful environment. So as it's, as it's coming, coming up, one of the, the first questions I just want you to think about is, thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thank you for the welcome. I uh, very much appreciate it. So what are the, one of the key, a couple of questions I'd like you just to think about initially is, what is AI? How would you define AI? Machine learning, how does machine learning fit into that? And just how big is this AI machine learning thing? So any suggestions on the definition of AI? Don't be shy. <laughs> really ML, okay. AI is a misnomer, ML is the real thing. Any other suggestions? Interesting enough, one of the things that I that I was grappling with as I started with my with my doctorate was the whole definition of AI. And um, there, I'm just going to switch the definition. sure. So, so one, of the, one of the key questions is how do you go about finding? And there is no generally accepted definition for AI. I think that's that's the big problem, which means that AI is in the mind of many of many people. And and how you think about AI and how you actually establish AI and define AI. Is very much um, based on on how you perceive um, perceive it. Thank you. Okay, so let, let me throw a couple of suggestions. Is that is that working for you? All right. We'll let people who know what they're doing do it rather than me. Yeah. Make sure everyone, the remote people as well to see it. So Set that. it to duplicate, and then it shouldn't. So while he's putting up here, here here's some examples, and, and I, I go back to um, Alan Turing. So back in 1955, he actually put out the question, can machines think? Um, and so there was the whole, oops, let's go back one. Hello. He's got to switch focus back to the present. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so in the imagination game, can machines think? And immediately you have, the, you have the situation of can machines think? You've got to define what machine is and what think is. So there's immediately the, the flow on. So my suggestion, in fact, what I, what I used in my studies, I said, uh, let me, let me use, make a simple approach. And so I use a simple approach of A as the ability for an algorithm, which in that case is the machine uh, and, and the artificial aspects, because you can also part, pass out parse out the artificial intelligence, artificial aspect and intelligent aspect. 
So the algorithm being the machine or the artificial, performing tasks that are associated with humans. Um, and initially I had, had intelligent life and then one of my reviewers challenged me, said, okay, so how do you define intelligent life? So I said, okay, humans, it's easier. <laughs> so there's, there's suggestions. So the ability for the algorithm to perform tasks that are commonly associated with humans. So therefore the whole thing immediately you got a situation, the combination of, of human and machine and therefore the socio-technical situation that we, that we have. There are multiple other definitions. So here are some of them. So there's the whole definition by type. So there's the artificial narrow intelligence, the general intelligence, the super intelligence, uh, talking about uh, the different capabilities. And most of what we've got nowadays, in fact, everyone, some people have challenged it. All we've got today is artificial narrow intelligence. Uh, general intelligence is where the AI will understand things and super intelligence is where it goes up the next level of being superhuman. Or you can look at some other elements of reactive, limited memory systems, uh, theory of mind, and really at this stage, limited memory is, if you think about uh, speaking to Alexa, she, she's forgotten the minute you've spoken, you know, she never, doesn't remember anything. Uh, you might have limited memory in that a GPS remembers that you're going somewhere, uh, but beyond that, there's not a huge amount of memory. Uh, and then theory of mind begins to start, starts to think about you know, broadly and, and think, using the mind and, and self-consciousness and the whole consciousness and sentience. Um, I don't know if you've been tracking it, but there was the, the question about Lambda um, which was, I believe, the Google um, bot claiming to be sentient, or at least the, uh, the, the person who was uh, asking questions of it uh, claimed to be sentient, in other words, have self-awareness. Uh, and so that really gets into the self-aware AI. And then this capability definition. So multiple different definitions, and whichever dimension you wish to use, that's fine. Uh, I think it just helps us understand that there is complexity. In it. So machine learning, where does that fit in? <clears throat> Machine learning, and, and I agree, essentially is just an, an aspect of artificial intelligence, if you wish. And then we got deep learning, which is kind of the next level. Uh, so we've got open AI team uh, that have largely pushed a lot of money into deep learning, which is essentially a self-reinforcing um, self-reinforcing machine learning capability. And you've got multiple ways of how you actually go through the learning process, be it supervised training. So you say, here's a cat uh, algorithm. This is a cat, this is a cat. Um, and so that's a supervised. The unsupervised is where you say, here's data, go and find it. Tell me a pattern that you find, uh, algorithm. Uh, give me supervised is kind of partial training and then the reinforcement is very much self-driving cars um, that we see in, in terms of Tesla, where you actually drive, have an accident. Oops, okay, you shouldn't do that. You've got to put some new information in and, and off you go. So that's the, those are essentially the three, three different dimensions. In terms, of, uh, in terms of the size, how big is it? And one of the questions that I had when I was doing my studies is, is this AI thing just something that everyone says they're doing and no one really does? And I found in my, in my research, and this is 20, just over 2,000 people searched against, it's around about one in four uh, on average. Uh, small organizations down to 10%, large organizations nearly 60% for above 20,000. So yeah, this is big. And that's development of AI solutions rather than just purely, um, purely their own use of a lot more use of, uh, in fact, you're probably using AI more than you realize you're using this embedded. And it's, the spend is fairly high. So the mode is run by between 10 and 20% of all asset expenditure on those companies doing AI, we're spending on AI, and you can see across the organization. So this is, this is big and it's growing and it continues to grow um, in extent. And what is happening? What are the capabilities that are really being used? Um, and machine learning, uh, the biggest one, uh, and we've certainly seen a lot of that uh, all the way through to computer vision. And I'd say computer vision is another one of those ones that is used more than people realize. Um, so facial recognition is just being used all over the place all the time. Um, and so there are a number of systems. And so a number of areas where it's used. So machine learning, decision support, uh, robotic process automation, uh, some, some of the key elements that are see, being seen. So this is kind of the, the picture that I'm, I'm looking at, at AI from. Does that ring true? That anyone would put up there and say, ah, that's wrong. Yeah. That largely, largely Especially AI folks at the back of the room, yeah. there, right? Yeah. Are you Have nodding? Yes, okay, right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Every challenge is a nice thing about AI because there's no definition of it. I can, I can say this is my position. <laughs> okay, good. So one of the big one of the big areas of AI, and just to start digging down into a couple of things. Um, so GPT-3, so this is the, the, the generative, the pre-trained 
uh, models where essentially there's a whole lot of information that these major transformers have gotten. A transformer essentially is just a, an algorithm that's ingesting tons and tons of information. And so you can see over the years, and this literally been you know, over the last couple of years, where information, so the this, this second line here is 60 gigabytes, is the information that, that, that was, was fed, and 345 uh, million is the number of tokens. So what it understands, how it's actually broken that in, into information it understands. And you can see right at the end, that's 11 billion um, that, uh, that the latest, uh, latest Megatron, in fact, the one right now um, that Facebook uh, is using uh, or Meta is using, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Blenderbot at all. It's a chat bot and I'll show a little bit about Blenderbot, but there they are 175 billion pieces of information that then uses. So what's interesting about this is that it actually then creates, um, by understanding all this information, you can see where it comes from. It comes from books, it comes from Wikipedia, uh, it's crawls, it's got open regs, so the Reddit, Reddit links, so things that are important to people, uh, news feeds, and that's the information that's ingesting on a regular basis. And then this is reinforced learning, so as it learns from interaction with people, it also learns. Uh, learn. And so we get these types of things that are, that are created as a result of that. And so coming out of GPT-3, there are, are three or four key elements we've seen right now. There's the, the visualization, so there's a product called DALI, which is actually a, um, it, it takes text and it creates an image. There's the natural language process in which literally I can talk or I can give a hint to, to the AI and there I can re return and can extend and can tell you a story based on that. And then there's this interaction, this visualization. So this is, I'm gonna play a, a short clip on this, just showing you um, in this particular situation. So we've got a, a human, this, this is a researcher based in Australia talking to an AI. And, and there's AI, AI interaction um, that, that happens as, as it goes through, she, she goes through the process of writing a book. Oops. Do we have sound? Give me a sec. We did, we did, we did. Just while Bob's working. Sorry. While Bob's working on that, Quentin, is that a computer generated lady on the right there? It is. Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. That's all. So probably what I, what I was going to show you then, we can, we can see if we can get it going, but essentially is there's the interaction between, uh, between the researcher and the, the computer generated image. And the image is actually, there's a full visualization of that image. And then there's a prompt to say, right, let's write a book. Um, and the book then is left totally up to the AI to decide what the book is, and what the book's about um, and how to, how to actually write it. So it's, on it. Up the top, we're using GPT-3. Okay, Got a world skip. first today. Lisa AI let's writing a book and then commenting. Yeah. Right. I want to... yeah, so I don't want to. Okay. All right. Here we go. I know. Okay, let's get started. What should we call this book? I think it should be called Leader's Adventures. Brilliant. I love it. That's so that's really generated by Doc program like leaders adventures that we've created she does and the cat is cute i could totally play with that cat it goes stop interaction okay let's do the first page this is so much fun i want to write a story with you every day <laughs> me too what would you like to write on the first page i'm thinking of a story about a girl who lives somewhere far away from here on another world she's having fun with her friends and family and she loves to play outside in the sunshine. Excellent. Let's write it out. Maybe we could start with Once Upon a Time. Do you want to continue? Sure. It's a nice story so far. Need a bit of prompting. Once Upon a Time. There was a little girl who lived on the planet Mercury. She liked to wear colourful dresses, and she always had flowers in her hair. I love this photo. 
It's so peaceful and calming. It's so colourful. So the girl was the story being happy. written and they're commenting on she the picture said, at the same time. I love my planet and my family. This is a great picture. The colours are so vivid and the child's happiness is so evident. For sure. That cat is still there, but it changed the colour. Of emotions. And the purple thing in the sky is whack. I like it. It's full of energy and wonder. What's next in the story? In the next page, there was a very big change. Please write it. One day, there was a huge storm on the planet. There were big tornadoes coming out of the planet's core. The girl could hear loud thunder and see bright flashes of lightning everywhere. Whoa, what will she do? The girl was scared. She said, I hope we're all okay. Okay, next page. The next day there was a lot less noise, but the sun was missing. The girl could look up and not see any stars at all. This is a beautiful and thought-provoking photograph. <laughs> Dolly 2 can't really do negatives very it, well. Interesting it comment. To Dolly 2 can, no, can do negatives. Yeah. I like yeah. the idea of negative space, though. In a way, this is what happens when one thing disappears. For sure. How will we resolve this? The girl was very sad. She said, I miss my beautiful planet. Listen to them. The, How can the I help? Kind of hard, the story's this is a created. heartbreaking image. Yeah. It speaks volumes about the human condition. And then? The girl heard a voice that said, I have an idea. The voice was coming from a strange robot. Right. I think you got you got the you got the picture. So essentially, the whole thing of there are multiple different elements that are happening there at the same time. So huge amount of data that's that's in uh, in the the GP three understanding what's going. So this is the one of the GPT three, the 11, 11 uh, billion uh, megatron. Um, the DALI being able to draw pictures based on different different uh, pictures, different ideas, different words, and it would then create pictures and the number of pictures that were then selected. Um, by the by the researcher and then the whole feeling and the interaction in terms of the emotion and the emotional response so just trying to give you a picture around the, the types of things that we we're looking at and then how we have to how we need to be thinking about what's changing and this is changing super fast and you can imagine here are people who thought you didn't have to worry about creatives so artists were okay and people who were writing books were okay uh, there would never be a problem uh, we're certainly seeing that that's maybe not not the case although the question is would you buy an art like that still prefer me to do some art versus, uh, versus AI. So maybe a bit of a quick discussion around the table. So what are the biggest data privacy concerns that you have? So we've got this, I've given the picture broadly about AI machine learning, uh, GPT-3. What are your biggest data privacy concerns and where does ethics do it? Maybe take a couple of minutes quickly. Yeah, so we table. thought maybe just take two minutes, discuss at the table what you think the biggest ethics issues are around AI. And then have somebody nominated to be able to give some feedback from the table. Okay, so we'll do a couple of minutes. Yep. And while waiting, there is dessert. <laughs> do have dessert, right? Yeah. 
Okay, 30 seconds to go, 30 seconds. Who is who is going to Okay, it's it. All right. Okay, I know we could talk about this for hours, but but okay. That sounded like we had some pretty good conversations. I'm just gonna go to each table. Who's the nominated speaker for this table? Matt, you've got it, mate. You've got it. Repeat everything I said. Uh, it, for us, it was a lot of questions around um, the sense of right and wrong, right? Humans can sometimes have challenges with what is right and wrong. And then when you start to step into morality, right, that varies significantly depending upon culture. Uh, and, the, and what we ended up discussing is that, because we have some AI experts here, that that ends up becoming just different data sets that needs to be built into the system. Very good. Very Thank cool. You. Who's the spokesman for this? <laughs> Obviously, Michael. He's never short of an opinion. Here you go, my friend. Uh, I guess I got nominated because I was the most vocal. But uh, really, the the way I see this and and was throwing it out on there is that where is the boundary? It's if you have one organization, they may they may put the boundary out over here, another organization over here. The government may be way out there. Who's right? Who's wrong? And who determines that boundaries? Right. That's very good. In good. fact, there's a whole Thank panel you. looking at those boundaries right now. I think. Correct. This yes. table, Gail. Gail. Thank you. So we were talking about the collection of the data, like Megatron has 11 billion pieces of information. Who is that information based upon and how are they protecting that information? As Sahil say, they will collect the data and they might not use it for a time, but where is it stored and how is it protected? Excellent. Go for it. All right, I'm gonna give three different scenarios that we talked through. The, the first one is kind of a minority report situation. So if you've seen the movie, you're guilty of something before you've actually done it. Uh, the next one is not being able to control things actually. So like Alexa, you tell Alexa to do something and it does it. What if Alexa decides she doesn't wanna do it and you can no longer control Alexa and then she's flipping your lights on and off all the time. Um, and then the last one is trying to differentiate between, and I'm maybe interpreting this incorrectly, but differentiating between the action, actions of a person versus what was a potentially an AI and say the person is taking credit for what the AI did, but did they really actually do it or was it the AI that was building it? And didn't they just sell the first AI created painting for some unbelievable amount of money? Ian, I think you are nominated for Art Table. Right? Uh, we took it more from the perspective of uh, basically profiling you as, uh, as you do any kind of web search, right? Uh, so. If you think about like ad tech companies, um, it's a very competitive bid network. Uh, and it's not just one company. So think about you, you go to ESPN.com as an example, and you get an ad space that is somewhat relevant to what you've been looking for or, or uh, profiling. That's not just one company doing it. That's, uh, that's dozens of companies doing it. So a whole bid network is happening in real time, and that's happening in less than 100 milliseconds. So they, so they have to be very smart on not overpaying for that bid, being competitive, and also displaying an ad that is relevant to you. And that all happens in less than 100 milliseconds, so the algorithms get better and better. Now, we also took it a step further and saying, okay, now that somebody can profile you better and can figure out what you're doing, um, as technology improves, it's not that hard to then start mimicking you and your behavior. And so from that perspective now, like you have a lot of uh, like, you know, fake, fake, you know, even today, like we have a lot of like a very good fake uh, visual uh, things that are done. But think of like a lot, a lot of this room, if you do any kind of speaking engagements, they're on video, they're on YouTube, that, that becomes not another data source. You can start data mining that and actually creating a, a persona that is, that is not real, right? That is uh, AI driven. And, uh, and now, you know, all, all your data, data streams, you know, your patterns, you know, where you're purchasing, 
that becomes a behavioral thing. So at that point in time, you're, you're, you're kind of creating this mimic and who's controlling that? My question is simple. Please don't let Skynet happen. <laughs> Indeed, and I think I think that's the, the. These are some really great ideas and great insights. So thank you, thank you so much. As far as that's concerned, whoops. So I think one of the, one of the key things is try and figure out number one, what is ethics? And my, my perspective around ethics is it's not just not doing bad things. There's the whole human flourishing aspect as well. So the ethics in my mind has got to be a balance between not doing bad things but doing good things as well. And so that whole whole balance between doing wrong, not doing wrong, and doing right. Rasheen is absolutely critical. And to me, that's just as important from an organization's ethical thinking uh, as just not being, not being caught doing the wrong thing. And so the whole aspects around the whole human flourishing, making sure that we, we focus on, um, on the ethical aspects. One of the things that um, we've got to be careful of is how it's trained and carefully how, how we train it and then unintended ethical con consequences can happen. So one of the important things around ethics a perspective on ethics is that we have to think about AI as we design it and design it ethically right from the beginning. Uh, we'd understand if we look at privacy, the whole design, privacy by design. Uh, we certainly need to be, and I'd say progressive organizations are thinking about ethics by design uh, in terms of the AI. So one question is who's, the eth who's ethics? So I have a designer who happens to be in the US. I have a developer in the Philippines or in India, perhaps I have a user in Germany, whose ethics? And what's the basis for that ethics? So one thing that's been happening, there's a, a moral machine, which is an MIT uh, project, has been going on for many years, which is literally providing a whole lot of examples. Okay, so cars driving, you're about to have an accident, you can't stop the accident and various scenarios. Um, and the whole, whole moral machine is trying to figure out the crowdsourcing of moral ethics that can then be applied to autonomous vehicles. Uh, similar, similar question in, in um, the Ask Delphi, they've got a whole lot of AI that's been trained with different ethical lenses. So ethical lenses like common good or utilitarian where the positive, as long as the, the, the sum of the, of the bad and the, and the good is, is good, they're okay, um, and virtue. So a number of different lenses they've been using and they use the moral AI to try and figure out what is the right approach at any particular point. But when you go about designing, the whole question is who's ethics? So when you actually start doing the design of your AI, you have to be very, very cognizant about what is happening, whose ethical mindset has been used, and is your, is your idea, is your AI solution gonna be judged as ethical by your users, by the, by the community, in, in, in the broad community, the broad stakeholder groups? So a couple of key questions to think about as you actually start designing it and thinking about this whole um, ethics by, um, ethic by design. Yes. I think we have to consider, first of all, what the AI is going to do. I mean, yep. to, to the AI is going to be a vehicle and driving that one set of standards, but if you're going into mining data in places, that's another set. Absolutely. That would seem to be the first thing. Contextual. Have. Yep. Correct. Absolutely. And in fact, I'll, I'll touch a bit on what the European AI Act, European Union AI Act is talking about and how they're actually thinking about it from that perspective. But you did right. It's contextual. What are your capabilities? How you've been applying it to your users? And what is also the, the level of, of knowledge of the user? So is a, is a child who's, who's vulnerable or is a an expert, agreed, absolutely. So here are some here are some um, incidents. Some, this I'm using the AI incident database. There are two major AI incident databases out there. One is this AI. You can't see in the corner there. It's, it's the AI incidents and controversies, controversies database. And the other one is the AI incident database. So there's two major ones. And this is uh, the total of 869 or so incidents that are currently recorded. And what I did was an analysis of the technologies that are associated with them. And application top is a bit of a catch-all, so certain applications um, around, for instance, the, um, the tracking of, of individuals or the um, writing of HR systems would be an application. But if you take a look at the top two as the two major uh, capabilities that are causing incidents right now, facial, facial analysis, so facial recognition of sorts, deep fake. 
And then we've got the whole natural language processing and a couple of others. And you see even further down, we've got things like um, content processing and so on, which may well be a pro uh, related to uh, natural language processing. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Get Zoom. It's going to put all this stuff in. <laughs> Zoom is going to put in this stuff where they can all of yep. a sudden analyze these people. Are the people on the other side going to know that Zoom is doing that? Right. So, so yes, one of the ethical considerations is the whole thing about transparency and exp explainability or explicability. And so one of the principles that then Zoom would, be have to, would have to say is, I'm explaining or I believe that I can explain why I'm doing that and I'm being transparent about the fact I'm doing it. Some of the big issues is where these things happen uh, and you just don't know that it's actually happening. So the student evaluation or the safety and security situation in the Euro Ukraine, uh, where literally it's been done without people knowing and there's no, no permission given, no transparency around it, which in my mind is a major ethical thing, ethical issue. So this, this one, the safety and security in the Brazil and so on, this is Clearview. I don't know how many of you know about Clearview. Essentially, they've got 3 billion pictures uh, scraped from places like social, social media, Facebook. You can imagine where they came from. So 3 billion images uh, that they've then taken, scraped without people's permission, without approval, uh, that they're now using. In fact, they're using for enforcement. Uh, and so there's even, even more concern about that. Yeah. Sorry, Gail. Yeah. They're going to be using it for the Super Bowl here. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and, and if you take a look at sports events, I know I know of organizations uh, who literally do that back and see where their 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 prime clients are. So their their ticket holders are sitting, are they engaged? Are they really there or are someone else using it, etc.? So they're all using it in that space. And I love this last one, the smile and wave, which is one of the latest, one of the critical organizations literally smile and wave is all you need to do as you do your purchase because it uses full bio biometric information uh, so the question here is how much information are we actually passing off and here are just some examples from the one of the instant database so i'm not going to touch on those if you look at deep fakes just a whole ton more happening in terms of the deep fakes um, you know everything from uh, the, the third one across the whole um, ukraine situation is deep fake uh, with Zelensky actually encouraging his um his um his people his the armed forces to actually surrender a full deep fake uh, that was done uh you know so a number a number of situations there was a deep fake around linkedin so you can actually create an, a face and a, and a voice uh for linkedin that you can go and purchase uh if you don't think that you look pretty enough or whatever um and so there's a whole lot of areas where deep fakes has been been used uh extensively I talked a little bit about uh, about uh, Blender Bot. So this is the metadata meta uh, or meta um, meta bot. As I say, 175 billion different terms. So I went on and I said, right, uh, tell me Blender Bot. What about AI and ethics? Your thoughts? And you could you could see the through the response that came out. This this is my this is actually my my interaction with Blender Bot. So I talked a bit about machine ethics and went went a bit away. So I said, okay, so I should be concerned about privacy and AI. And then so, so Clearview, Clearview AI came up, which is interesting, uh, talking about law enforcement, um, matches more than 20 billion images indexed from the internet. Uh, and I said, what about privacy in AI? And then tell me a bit more. So immediately she went on and talked to me a bit about 1984. Uh, so I got, got a bit offline. Our information isn't really private anymore. No. <laughs> this is the bot telling me this. This, right? this is the bot telling me. So, so this, yeah, this is a bot response. Well, that's the only interaction I had with that bot. Now, this is what the assumptions the bot made about me. Okay, so I'm interested in AI and privacy. Yeah, okay, that's really good. I'm concerned about ethics and artificial intelligence. I know about Clearview AI. I've read 1984. I didn't say I'd read 1984. Uh, and I like comic books. So this is the assumption that is now made. And this is now the footprint that's, that chat up, that, that blender bot is now about me because of that interaction what there were four or four messages or four, four screens I touched. Now this information clearly this is the type of thing that's happening and we start talking about the the, the privacy that's happening in terms of our data and how it's actually growing and growing in, our, in the background. Let me touch on this briefly I know we're getting close to close to the end of time but I just want to touch on this one because I think it's really interesting and something that we're going to, we're going to have to think about. So this is the European Union's AI uh, Act. And so what they've defined, they've actually split, the, split AI into four different levels based on a risk approach. And so there's low and minimal risk, there's limited risk, there's high risk and unacceptable risk. So at the top, you can understand manipulative, subliminal techniques, exploiting the vulnerable, all 
are a no-no, you cannot do, do it, you may not do. Then there's the high risk aspect where you've got, there's a certain amount of management that needs to take place. Is, so here we're talking about law enforcement or safety systems uh, in, in toys and planes to make sure that they work properly. Then there's trans, so, and what's required there is regulation. So there you've got to comply with regulations. Then you get down to limited risk where transparency is required. So this goes back to the comment that you made in terms of committee needs to say what they're doing. So chatbots, emotional recognition systems, and deep fakes. Um, and I'm, I'm what if, if, if all, all, that, all they have to do in terms of deep fakes is say, we do deep fakes, by the way. Um, and that's all there to worry about. Uh, I, I'd wonder whether that's right. And then all the others, um, there's no obligations. That, that means, so whatever they don't define up top there, <laughs> so it is a little bit open. But the point is that it does give a, a basis. And remember what's happening here is this is going GDPR route. So if you violate, there's a possibility of what's a 10% of global revenues. Uh, if you violate on privacy, this is going the same direction. Uh, so clearly there's a, the, 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 the use of uh, John, yeah. finance. And by the way, who believes deep makes a limited risk? I have no idea about that. Yeah. He's talking about going to the GDPR route, but one, one of the things that's going on in the GDPR is that the, the state governments in the EU they completely ignore GDPR with respect to surveillance and law enforcement. Yeah. And so I would expect they would do the same thing here, particularly with the prohibited stuff, yeah. like real-time remote biometric identification, that kind of stuff. They, they view themselves outside the law of the yeah. EU, even though they're EU member states. Yep, yeah. I, I, I would absolutely. I'd absolutely agree. And I think the big, this is one of the big problems. So it goes back to whose ethics, which is everyone's ethics is different. Whose regulations, it goes to everyone, everyone's regulations is different as well. So this has become a really complex space that we're going to have to negotiate and uh, negotiate trying to bring AI systems into the organization. So to be, this is something to be aware of, this is in draft at the moment, be aware of it, it's going to impact the organization. So just those are the types of things I think it does certainly come in a long way. I'm not sure what, I don't know the details when it's going to be. Okay, so some ideas, just think about all the various areas in terms of where the source of data may come from, some type of concerns and some type of actions that you, you need to think about. And really just, I, I think all I want you to do tonight is to, to kind of give you a feel for what's out there, what's happening and how we need to be thinking about it. How we need to, as IT leaders, consider what is happening. So yes, on one hand, we've got to take advantage of all the benefits of AI, but on the other hand, we've got to look at this human flourishing and do it in an ethical way. So AI is coming fast. Think about it in terms of, think about it holistically and make sure you're looking at it from both the, the end user and from, uh, from the business perspective. Machine learning is very common. GPT-3, 4, 5, whatever it's going to be after that is going to have a major impact. That's all I can say. We've already seen it having a major impact. Um, and by the way, one of the key things that move from artificial one to yeah. So, so one of the things that we've seen is that is the, is the move from from an artificial intelligence to broad intelligence. So there's a latest um, uh, latest product that's come out of deep uh, deep learning um, called so, which is really a combination of the capabilities of thinking of verbal, verbalizing and actually actually automating through robots. And so we're starting to see even that be coming towards a artificial general intelligence uh, beginning to come through that, that is the potential. Ethics and AI, it's a leadership issue. The reason in, in my, my dissertation, I force is enterprise risk issue the board. So when I, once I talk about risk, I'm at the board issue. And that's where I really believe AI and ethics need to be dealt with. And then the whole privacy concerns, just think about those, how are you gonna be aware of the regulations, keep a track of them. Um, and really be, be aggressive in that. I, I really believe you can be leading organizations in AI. And in my mind, ethical, pro-ethical AI is the way you're gonna be leading and gonna be the ones that can actually take it forward. Brilliant, we must have some questions. Come on, there's <laughs> gotta be some questions on this. Do we have any online questions, first of all? Okay. Yep. Yes, yes, the minute it's published, I'll. Repeat the question I was asked, can I share my dissertation? Yes, the minister published, I will certainly share that. Right, we have one online question, Quinton. Huh? Yeah, TJ, TJ just asked, what steps are you personally taking based upon your privacy concerns? So, so my, my, my main focus from, from my 
personal perspective is just, is to understand what is going on and how am I actually moving. So I'm not I'm not overprotecting, but I am saying I need to know what's actually happening with my information. And so things like when I went onto Blenderbot and I saw they, what they were doing there, I had to, I sat back and I thought, okay, so let me be very careful about what's actually happening and how I'm actually going to respond to that. So one of the things that, that I'm I'm trying to run the the balance of don't get over concerned and pull back, but at the same time, be wise and really learn what's going on and kind of just as much as you possibly can. Yep, one second. It's really interesting. Uh, my question is that now there's also trying toward explainable AI. So to what extent that you feel this could uh, partially maybe address this question and then um yeah so what's your view about yeah. so the whole unexplainability and explicability is one of the, the key things that has become a focus right now so we actually get into the situation where we say right ai explain yourself so you made a decision how did you make a decision and, and actually unwind your logic and i think in some cases that can be done but if you actually look at the thinking the learning process the actual learning process is not human learning process and so they are to explain why it got to a particular decision. It's going to go a very convoluted path that would not be human and human understandable. And so we have to then run on, on, the, on the next to it and say, right, so what was the base of that decision? And let's try to end, end, end result in another way, even though we may not exactly track what was, what was happening. So I think that, that's one of the issues in terms of the explainable AI. And yes, there's a very big movement, movement in terms of explainable AI, but I'm... I would, I'd battle to understand that we can have, we will be able to understand that all the way along. So I'm driving a car, the car makes a decision. I can't say, right, stop, stop. Why'd you make a decision? <laughs> Something has to happen. And I think we've got to go off the fact and say, right, the car made a particular decision. Why did it make a decision? Was a bad training? Wasn't a bad training? And what information did it use to come to that decision? So it depend, depends on how the learning was done and how that interaction occurred. Um, but but my, my own perspective is that we need to ensure there's human in the loop, and that's what's, what's going to drive progressively more and more of the explainability. That's a very good point, you know, because if the machine can explain what it did, can you understand, even understand its explanation, right? Because it's not thinking maybe the same way as we are, of course. or 30 different variable is explained and predict something. But that doesn't make sense because that 30 variables just doesn't make sense add together. So what does that mean when you add them together? Yeah. So that's what I meant by yeah. in the algorithm. Right. So, so it depends, it depends which learning you're using. So if you're using if you're using biased learning, yes, that's the case. But if I'm using reinforced learning, the AI is reinforcing its own learning. It's not actually, there's no human intervention that reinforced learning. A lot of the deep learning is actually reinforced. So the AI is learning from itself. And so how can I exp explain? I agree with you in supervised learning saying, well, this is a cat. If the dog was a cat, you're wrong. This is a cat. So that, yes, can be, that can be trained in. But if you're looking at reinforced learning, it literally is the AI goes ahead and learns and says, right, well, here's the answer. And you can you got there and you can say, well, I went this route, this route, this route, this route, and you say, well, I don't understand how they could possibly get you that answer. And I don't know if any of you have looked at kind of a neural network, a deep neural network, you look at the different steps. I can't understand how it can go from a picture to a blur and come to an answer. It just doesn't make any sense to me, but the computer can see some trend there that I can't. But that, that's a big thing. <laughs> yeah, here in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you mentioned that one out of four companies are developing or using the AI. So pretty much every company is affected in such a way or either consuming the AI or providing the data that will be used by AI. So what do you suggest how the company should prepare or should companies create some ethical committees, teams, department that will evaluate that or be involved all the time while they are providing, creating such a products were affecting their services. So yeah, what do you suggest? Yeah, a, a, a great question. And in fact, I, I suggest it should occur on three levels. One is at the level of the team. So the team is actually doing the design itself needs to be thinking about ethics and embedded in the team needs to be someone thinking about ethics and is, is responsible for ethical thinking. 
Then at the organizational level, you need to have governance that you're talking about. So all the governance, mm -hmm. the, uh, the chief risk officer, ethical committee, they need to be looking at, at, at and understanding the ethical implications of what they're doing. And then I'd say environment, you've got to be looking at the governments and the regulators. What are they doing? Are they insisting that we have audits? Do we need to have ethical audits that are occurring along with our financial audits? And so really in my mind, it occurs at those three, three different levels. And each of those needs their specific focus. And again, goes back to the whole thing, context. You've got to understand, don't, don't apply the one context to a, an AI that's doing, uh, you know, preventing people from hacking your system, but do it when you've got GPT-3 going, <laughs> you know, so just think about that context, really. Quentin. Yeah. I got the mic. Ian, yes. I got the mic. It's got the mic back, good. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it's going the GDPR route. I'm very curious, I mean, I've read articles, but I'm very curious why uh, US is not coming up with a similar approach. I know there's CCPA, but you know, because if we are going down the GDPR route from a European perspective, what is gonna to happen to AI if we haven't even tackled the privacy issues here? What are your thoughts, General? I, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. <laughs> I, I really, I don't, I don't see that the US is comfortable with a certain level of privacy or lack of privacy, more lack of privacy than, than Europe is. And other countries are even, are even more lack of privacy. So it, it's, it's contextual, it's, it's within, within the country, you're gonna make those decisions. My big concern is when you start using it around the world, how does that work? Unless you get some type of level of consensus. Uh, if, if you take a look at some of the books that have been written around AI, it really is, people are starting to say this is like the, um, the nuclear controls, controls that have to be put in around the world. So we all agree in that this is what's required and this is the level of, of nuclear armament that you're allowed to have and not allowed to have. And it seems like we may need to get to that particular point. But how are we going to get people around the table? I don't know. It's going to take a while. And I think from now, we need needed to come from everywhere. So that there needs to be a, ground, a grassroots effort to push it up. We need businesses committed to it. We need pressure groups committed to it. We need governments committed to make it happen. And progressively, they'll start to start hanging together. I'm hopeful because I believe this has got a huge advantage potentially for, for not only businesses, but for, the, for society and for the environment. But it's going to take determination to make it happen. Um, so I, I'm going to take a step back on all of this and, and put like the human back into it for a moment. Please. Um, in the United States, you know, and we're actually around the world, you know, through COVID and being glued to our, our Zoom channels and everything for our meetings, we were became very aware of all the DI, DI uh, components as well as becoming our genuine and authentic selves and given freedom mm -hmm. to learn more and explore more around the uh, learnings and, and becoming self-motivated. So how do you balance that with an employee now knowing that Zoom is going to analyze all of their facial movements, that every single click on their computer is being analyzed as to where they're going? How do you balance the humanity of what we've been encouraged to do in the last two or three years versus literally truly 1984 pounding down on us at the same time it's like opposites so i find that very hard to manage yeah absolutely agree and i think that that to me is this this whole balance between the technology and taking advantage of the technology and the human flourishing aspect and i would say that if i if i go look back the last two or three years we had the the COVID situation it was leaders that had to step in and lead and manage that brought, about, that brought about a level of, of, of integration. So diversity drove diversity, drove equity, drove inclusion. And so there's the important, importance of leaders stepping in and saying, I'm taking more responsibility and ownership for that. Now, I think in this situation, you've got to have the same, same situation where the recognition of what I've got in front of me and what I can use for good and for harm. And am I choosing the right thing? So just as much in the, in the DNI space, I had a choice between how am I gonna actually take advantage of it? And we, I think the world generally lent towards, let's embrace it, let's enhance it, let's make sure we get greater and greater recognition around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I think we need to have the same, same situation with, uh, 
with the capability that we have as, to, as, as, as with technology and AI in front of us. How do we use it for good, for benefit for the organization, but good for human flourishing and everything else that's associated with it? And then the, the issue around, so if I'm going to be monitoring, how can I use this for your benefit? So if I'm going to be monitoring, give it back to you and say, is there a way of you, like we're tracking on our watches, am I sleeping enough? I'm getting feedback. So I'm getting biometrics, I'm getting monitoring. Am I sleeping okay? Is my sleep good? I didn't concentrate during that particular part of the lecture. Why didn't I concentrate? What was missing? What was wrong? And so this whole thing about me being able to use that information as well for my own benefit and own growth versus only being used against me. And then this balance between against and for and, and self-use. What a wonderful Great. discussion. Quentin, thank you so much. Let's show our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Just get a couple of photographs again. <laughs> sure.